lines for the end. We looked at the, about halfway through the four criteria for establishing a negligence claim, uh, duty, breach, duty causation, and remoteness tonight. And duty tends to be a longer issue. So if you are thinking about things in terms of exams, um, it's not like it's presumed that duty would be the only issue on an exam. There could be a duty and breach issue. Uh, and you'd have to go through all four stages, meaning um, duty, breach, causation, and remoteness. And we've looked at three types of duties of care, or three tests for the duty of care. One is uh, the ends Kamloops test, which looks at instances where there's an established duty of care, where it's a novel duty of care, meaning the court is being called upon to recognize a new duty of care between these two types of parties, then it's the Adams Cooper test. And then the other day we saw a third test for the topic of psychiatric damage, which modified the Adams Cambridge test. Uh, Specifically, what was the modification? Yeah, so a bit more precisely, that the harm suffered is reasonably foreseeable in a person of normal fortitude and sensitivity. So what we have is these tests, as you get into practice, you'll find there are many tests for the duty of care, for different duties of care. And they all kind of modify the Adams Kamloops test in some way. We'll look at one other one with negligent misrepresentation. <coughs> But then that'll be it. But there are a lot of different duties of care, uh, tests for duties of care. Did Sadanti modify Mustafa? How? Um, because Mustafa is speaking of a person of normal fortitude and sensibility. Right. Whereas Sadanti is speaking more of subjectively of the person. Um, the nature of the person is more or less fine the person. Isn't there a twist to Sadati um, um, when it compares to Mustafa? The, so what we talked about last time was what do you have to establish in terms of psychiatric harm? Do you need medical evidence? And we found that you don't. <coughs> which was what Sadati was saying. You don't need to have suffered from a recognized psychiatric injury. Um, and the further complication we talked about was if you don't have to bring in medical evidence, medical expert evidence, what we saw in Sadati was she succeeded based upon, exclusively on, uh, witness testimony, the friends and family. So it didn't modify the duty of care. What Sadati added was what evidence is needed in order to bring a claim for psychiatric damage. And the court said, you don't need to have 
medical evidence. It's not a requirement. You can. So we had discussed some of the difficulties with that. That in Sadati, the case was Sadati had suffered after the second car accident of five, uh, she suffered a personality change. And arguably that's not a recognized psychiatric injury. And I mentioned that to recall the discussion we had where I asked you, why would the Supreme Court of Canada seem to relax the, the uh, analysis in a psychiatric damage as compared to other areas of duty of care that we've looked at, where they've been more concerned, it seems, with making sure that the scope of potential plaintiffs is not so wide. <clears throat> just, just to be clear on this, um, my impression of Mustafa was that it seems to be an objective test of someone of normal fortitude uh, right. and uh, sensibility. Yeah. Um, is that still the standard position? Yes. Um, even if it was Sadati, and Sadati had to go through the process in the first instance that one would have had to measure whether your starting point is are you of normal fortitude and sensibility? So because we had a discussion where Mustafa may have been dis decided differently if it was decided after Sadati. Yeah, I asked whether or not it would have been uh, because it seemed, Sadati seems to have relaxed matters. But I, my impression was that at least the majority thought it wouldn't have changed, the majority in the room, because um, Mustafa wouldn't have had the uh, witness testimony. So Sadagi had witnesses saying she's a different person after the second accident. Um, Mustafa was, trying to think of polite words, highly concerned about cleanliness. Nothing would change after that. And his reaction fell below that of the person of normal fortitude. Whereas Sadati, it wasn't a matter of her being below normal fortitude and sensibility. It was, um, this is what happened to her. And if it had been proven, for example, that she was susceptible to a personality change, just to link it up with Mustafa, then it could have been said she wasn't of normal fortitude, but there was no evidence of that. So, so that's how Sadati would have been brought into closer proximity actually with Mustafa. Other questions before we go on to causation? I followed the, the Sadari the discussion. So means that the, the facts for the jury to decide whether there is a change in personality or is there is a change, there could be a change on the reason, the personal reason for quality. I guess. Because yeah, the, so So the, Mustafa says, uh, 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 modifying Jan's Kamloops, is this person, is the harm suffered that which would have been suffered by, if we might put it in, in lay terms, the average person? What in legal terms we call uh, the reasonably foreseeable in a person of normal fortitude and sensibility. And if we, we, we exclusively rely on the weakness, then because the weakness is there, that's Sorry, friends. Sorry, rely on the weakness? Witness means the friends or witness. relatives, yeah. So if we rely on friends or relatives, yeah. they, can, they cannot speak to the, how a reasonable person of the reason, normal fortitude will react no, to the kind but of harm. What they're testifying to in Sadati is the change in personality. Before accident two, 
she was one person. After the accident, she was another. So they can testify to the change in the personality. But that doesn't depend upon, um, that's independent of the reasonable foreseeability of, a per of harm in a person of normal sensibility. So for the second part, who will decide? You said, who will decide this kind of harm will cause a person of normal fortitude to suffer? What do you mean, who will decide? Because we have to decide this is a causation. Is, this, is, this is causation. Yeah. So that the relatives, the witness, cannot speak to that there is a change of human personality, but they cannot speak to whether a reasonable person will suffer the same kind of. Yeah, but that's, as person. I said, that's not what their testimony is going to. Their testimony is evidentiary. They are establishing that Sadafi was one person before the second accident and was a changed person after the second accident. They are not testifying to her being a person of normal fortitude. Yeah, but just, to, yeah, yeah. But to, to satisfy the task, you have to say for sure whether, for, 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 for sure whether these kind of hunger costs are similar to me psychiatric harm to a reasonable person. But yeah. who can speak to the second part of the test? It means that because the relatives and friends, can, they cannot speak to the... the second, part. what are you referring to as the second part? The, the first is that there is a change in personality. And the second part is that we have to say that for sure that a reasonable person in a similar situation will have the same kind of change in personality. But, uh, I've said that already that the witnesses are only testifying to the change in her personality. Your question is, who assesses, I think, yeah. who assesses whether or not Sadafi is a person of Reasonable uh, normal fortitude, fortitude and sensibility. Yeah. And what I said was, that would come at the state, so it would be on Sadafi to establish that she is, that she meets the criteria, and then it would be up to the defendant to say, no, she isn't, and to prove that but before the, evidence. But if so that is obliged to establish that he himself is a reasonable person, and what kind of evidence he can well, produce? Well, I was about to talk about that. So if we think about Mustafa, Mustafa would have clearly a hard time establishing that he was a person of normal fortitude and sensibility, that his reaction was within that realm. So he could assert it, but then Culligan Water would say, well, hold on. You know, there are people that have different things in their water as a freak accident, and they don't cease working. They don't cease, forgive me if I cut this off, but I think he stayed in the house. Like He, he became a shut-in of some kind. He wouldn't do anything. He was so um, gripped by this fly in his water. And Chief Justice McLaughlin was talking about, well, that falls below what a person of normal fortitude or, as I said before, the average person. The average person would not freak out by a fly. In Sadati, there's nothing to say that Sadati was abnormal, not an average person. So the burden of proof on a balance of probabilities is on the plaintiff to establish that they satisfy the test. But as I've said before, in private law, the defendant should raise arguments to the contrary. So if a defendant doesn't challenge Sadati, for example, as being a person of normal fortitude, they're giving up <coughs> that argument. So that's where you get the argument, counter argument, the uh, format that I've talked about. Val Clark, did you have a question? So causation, causation is very simple and very hard. You'll see, I don't think Solomon does this. I'm not sure if you all are reading just the one text or if you've gone into another one. Some places, some authors will talk about causation as causation in fact and causation in law. Do you understand? Have you come across that? 
What's the difference, do you think? Factual causation is pretty much, pretty much the same thing uh, factually caused uh, the part that took place. Yeah. But then the legal causation is what we're looking at substantially. Yeah, the substantive aspect. So causation in fact is what do the facts tell us? Causation in law is what is the legal measurement. So I'm not going to use that language. I think it's confusing because it then gets into remoteness and I find this way better to, to separate causation from remoteness. Generally speaking, causation is satisfied with something called the but-for test. So the phrase would be something like, but for the defendant's negligence, the plaintiff would not have suffered the harm. So factually, we have to see if that fits, and the but-for test gives us this sort of substantive analysis. So we have the Canadian case of Kaufman, where Kaufman was not held to be liable because the causal relation between the alleged negligence and the injury had not been made out. I give you that as a Canadian example. I find the Barnett, and Chelsea, and Kensington Hospital case to be a useful one to talk about causation. Again, on the but four standard. So, if on an exam, if you you need to have an authority for your propositions, so a but four test, you can cite Kaufman or Barnett. But factually, Barnett, I think, is useful because uh, three men uh, seem to have been sickened by tea. One of them had actually been poisoned with arsenic. So Barnett goes to the Chelsea Hospital and says, I'm really sick. And the doctor says, you're not. Go home. You'll be OK in a couple of hours. Well, five hours later, he was dead. And so Barnett's family sues the doctor and says, you didn't even look at him. You just sent him home. He died because of you. So. We have the, we've established a duty, just skipping ahead to where we are with causation. We've established a doctor has a duty of care to the patient. We established they fell below the standard because the doctor didn't even see the person, the inspector, or uh, investigate. Then the question is, did the doctor's negligence cause Barnett's death? And this is where Barnett's claim failed. It failed because arsenic poisoning is irreversible. Meaning, if he went to the hospital, they don't have a cure. There is no cure. So Barnett was going to die anyway. The doctors, we can't quite say negligence, but carelessness maybe up to the point of causation was unfortunate but did not cause the poisoning. So, but for the doctor's negligence, Barnett would not have died. We can't say that. It's not made out factually because he was poisoned with a fatal uh, poison. Poison that's not there. So I find, as we looked at with contract, I find Barnett useful to underscore the point that just because you have wrongdoing 
does not mean necessarily there is a tour passion that is successful. None of us want to go to that doctor at the Chelsea Hospital. But he was not negligent in this case. And that's something to keep in mind, I think, for tort. Bad things happen, but they don't necessarily lead to a successful tort action. A good example was the case we looked at uh, the other day, the Maple Leaf Foods case with the uh, Mr. Submarine franchise owner, uh, franchisees, <coughs> suing Maple Leaf Foods for the contaminated meat that they didn't deliver to them, but there's an allegation there is contamination. Arguably, something went wrong, but that doesn't lead to a successful tort action. Sometimes that's hard to explain to, uh, to clients. So if we stop there, that would be causation. But unfortunately, causation then becomes more complicated. And it becomes more complicated simply because, not to be trite, but life is complicated. Things happen in weird ways. And I think a very good example of that is under the established exceptions uh, for multiple negligent defendants rule, the case of Cook and Lewis. You might have looked at this case in a foundations course. I think it comes in there sometimes. So the scenario is two hunters go hunting. They both fire at the same time in the same direction, right where I think it was Cook. Cook and Lewis. No, I know. <laughs> I'm trying to remember which one was the victim. I think Cook was the victim. Right where Cook was. and Cook is hit. But the problem is, somehow, Cook is only hit by one bullet. They're the same bullets used by both hunters, but Cook has a problem. If we look at this on a but-for causation analysis, Cook cannot prove which one hit him, which one shot him. But we know both did some did the shooting, and they don't contest that, the uh, defendants. So what do you do? What did the, court, the Supreme Court do in this case? Which means what in this case? He can collect from either of them uh, the full amount and uh, later on they should sort it out in between themselves. And also change the proof they have to prove because they said they have more chance to know which one was actually. So either both of them are responsible and pay or they decide which one is yeah. responsible. So, and what that brings up, though, is sure. so, we know that there is an injustice that didn't happen, but mm -hmm. we have problem with actually proving with the that for analysis. Then the courts cannot um, let the defendants take advantage of the situation yeah. uh, because probably they know who is responsible. So they, yeah. they, might, they have more information, yeah. and they were both negligent yeah. also. So, so if we look at Cook and Lewis and use this case as an example, we look for certain things based on this case. Both hunters were in the wrong, so to speak. Both fired at Cook. They didn't know he was there, but 
that's what negligence is about. Another factor is Cook can only do so much to prove causation. So they made a mistake. This was the. Okay, we're going to go with the... Cook. <laughs> Cook can only do so much to prove causation. And in this case, the test of but for cannot be satisfied. But it's not because Cook has failed to meet his evidentiary burden, necessarily. It's because, generally speaking, what we see it in the exceptions to but for is the state of science does not allow us to make that link. So we could imagine, well, mu there must have been differences between the two bullets that we could have traced back to one of the hundreds. Everything seemed to be the same. Keep in mind, this is uh, late 1940s, early 1950s. So the courts are concerned about, as Constantina said, an injustice. But there is another factor that is of concern to the courts, and that is they don't want to be seen to be making the test easier for Cook in this case. It can't be seen as though the court is so sympathetic that they're going to bend the rules to help Cook. That's not what they're doing. They're trying to say, look, Cook has done all that he can, and as a few of you have said, the defendants are in a better position sometimes to know what precisely went on. And since they were in the wrong, we, the courts, are going to put the onus on them to, sh to say, well, no, it wasn't me, it was him and to prove that. But if they don't, exactly. then both are liable and both pay. <clears throat> so the exception to but for causation is an attempt by the common law courts to, one, recognize that the but for test is not perfect. It is not infallible. And we've seen this before with the duty of care test. The duty of care test has changed over time. But because the but for test does not work in 100% of the situations, that means that there are certain situations in which there may be an injustice if a strict approach to the but for test was applied. And so the courts endeavor to remedy that by saying, well, we accept that the plaintiff has met its evidentiary burden. It has demonstrated on a balance of probabilities that these two shot him. <coughs> now we say to these two, what do you have to say? Can you tell us which one of you actually did? Can you prove to us? Or provide evidence, and if you can't, then we will find you both liable. Now, pushing that further, a critique we'll see in the tests or the cases coming up is, does that not create another injustice? Meaning, one guy is paying for something he didn't do. Yeah. Did you? I don't hear what's going to say. I just want to say, but the thing is that both of them at the beginning were, uh, were wrong. Mm -hmm. So it's not exactly an at this time. Yeah. And both of them were negligent. Maybe. 
Yeah, so because the, the brother, Louis' brother, was waving, they misunderstood, you know? Yeah. If somebody is waving, you know, you might question that it's, he's not waving I just want because... To go or wait, you know? You yeah. don't have to shut every single down. No. <laughs> um, so, in terms of the latter injustice, that one person is paying for something he didn't do, I think the courts re would rely on what I just mentioned, that they gave both defendants the opportunity to show that it wasn't them. And if the defendants can't take that opportunity, it's not the court's job to go further. Both have been established to have been in the wrong, and the court has satisfied the burden of proof of the plaintiff was met. Yeah. Is that is that the second um, part of the exception to the test? Mm -hmm. You said there are you were you were explaining about the exceptions to the but no, I was explaining only this case. Uh, okay. What I was talking about was what do we take, what are the characteristics we take from this case in terms of when an exception comes. Okay. What I said was that the plaintiff has done as much as he or she can in terms of meeting his or her burden of proof and cannot go further because of the state of science is what it usually is. Then we also have defendants who are who have engaged in wrongful conduct in some way. In this case, two guys fire at Cook simultaneously. Even though they didn't mean to, they didn't know he was there, they did so anyway. So that was another point that I say. Then the court says, well, since you two were both in the wrong, we're going to ask you, can you tell us which one of you did this? Because if you can't, then we will find you both liable. And the final point I mentioned that we'll see a bit later is, some will criticize that outcome as creating another injustice, that one person is paying for what they didn't do. And I think the court's response would be, well, we gave them the opportunity to show that they did not do it. And if they could not take advantage of that, that's not the court's job to do anything further than that. So that's what I was saying. Yeah. I mean, if if this case, if this old case, 1951, if this case happens today, the plaintiff clearly can can prove. Hopefully, yeah. but like I don't know. I'm not sure why they couldn't do it in 1951. Because there's a you know, projectile missile. Mm. I think it's a scientific, me scientific measurement. Now it's I think I will. Well, sometimes, sometimes bullets are so damaged that you cannot get a reading for the particular gun. I think simply they were just, you know, they were playing these cards. The court will not know which one of us, so we will go. Maybe. It was, you know, free. And, uh, well, maybe that's a hell of a chance. Yeah, that's why I think they changed uh, the onus, you know, so they had to go. My question to you, you, you mentioned uh, that the key point is that it has been established by the point of it, that both defendants were responsible, they, they were wrong, they were shooting. The yes. So based on that fact, could it be fair to, to say that the court actually refused to have a rule that will produce absurd results? I don't follow. Uh, the court refused to have a bad court test that would result in absurdity at the end because the plaintiff, based on bad court, cannot think point on one plaintiff. And the absurdity being that these two guys get off. Get off because, okay. you know, the plaintiff yeah. cannot 
I, I think. So the rule is not to produce absurd results. If you have the, 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 uh, the someone at sure uh, caught I, doing the wrong. Right? I, I, yeah, I understand what you're saying. I put it a bit more precisely only because um, I I think we need to keep in mind the exception to but four is more narrow. It's only where exception. yeah, and it's only where the plaintiff has done everything he or she could, but the state of science is such that they cannot make that 51% link on the normal but for standard. And the reason why I'm going into that is, we'll see, in my opinion, uh, the exception to but for causation it is really not well understood in Canada. And I think the cases we go through from Canada will show this. So I'll, I emphasize that point for that reason, that it is an exception. And that's why I talked about the criteria in Cook. So if we go down to the heading, recent attempts to modify the but for test, materially increased risk of injury, and the British case of McGee versus National Coal Board. So McGee is kind of where things in Canada and the UK start. And the question is, it's different from <clears throat> so, what case is that? McGee versus and National McGee is different from Cook and Lewis because we'll, we'll see through the facts, I think it's best to say. So factually, McGee works at a brick factory where there's loss of dust and he develops dermatitis, a skin condition. But McGee also rode his bike home after work. And he could have incurred dermatitis through that ride back home. Dust <coughs> being kicked up during that ride back home. So the question is, what caused McGee's dermatitis? We have one arguably <coughs> tortious source the National Coal Board, but one arguably non-tortious source, just riding on the road. So how does the court deal with that? Because when we get down to the but four test, McGee cannot show that it was the dust from the National Coal Board factory where he worked that caused his dermatitis as opposed to the dust from the bike ride home. What does the court do here? It's the word of my proof. But how do they characterize it first before they shift? I think we accept the causation as to the risk of injury. Yes. So it's enough to prove that um, the defendant uh, caused a situation that posed a risk to develop dermatitis. And not just a risk. The phrase is a material increase in the risk of injury. And the wording is important because the court is trying to say this isn't just some random event. Remember I used the term de minimis before when we talked about intentional torts that arguably walking down Young Street Millions of torts are uh, committed every day when people bump into you. But you can only sue when it's beyond de minimis. That's what the court is saying here. There's a material increase in the risk of injury. So the National Coal Board, by the House of Lords fines, by failing to have showers, washing facilities to wash off the dust 
has materially increased the risk of McGee developing dermatitis. And because of that, the court says, McGee has satisfied his burden of proof, that is, balance of probabilities. And they say to the National Coal Board, can you tell us why you wouldn't be liable here? So in the fact that I think, in case it isn't clear, it should be mentioned. I've never worked in a brick factory. <laughs> but I work. Okay. When I was high school. Okay. <laughs> My understanding is it's very, very dusty. It's a lot of dust just gets layered on your skin. So there's something, this isn't just he walked down a dusty road kind of thing. There's something substantial here. So let's be clear about this sequence because there's a pattern in these cases. With McGee, we have two sources of harm. What is the harm? Dust. <coughs> Dust leading to dermatitis. There are two sources. The factory and the bike ride home. McGee, through no fault of his own, cannot show on a but-for standard that it was the dust from the factory that caused his dermatitis. So the court says, in this particular scenario, we are willing to amend the causation analysis to one of, did the defendant materially increase the risk of McGee's injury? And they find that the coal board had because they, did, they failed to provide washing facilities so that workers could wash off the dust that accumulates after hours of work. And the court puts it to the defendants <coughs> to basically show that they were not responsible. But again, there, there was a, a fault of the factory for not having showers. So the court went after the fault yeah. to start unwrapping the theory because obviously uh, who can lose could be applied. It's not two people shooting at the same time. It's a different scenario. Yes, yeah, that's why I said it is one tortious and one non-tortious. Whereas in Cook and Lewis, we had two torts committed simultaneously. So in other words, I'm asking if there, there were showers, then obviously uh, uh, there would be no material increase in risk at all. Or at least it would be harder to establish that, we, we can say. Like, I, it would be very, I think it'd be very hard for me to have won if there were showers. That's where I would be. Okay, well, I'm just, you know, yeah. the plaintiff has the burden of proof mm -hmm. uh, in terms of condition. Yeah. The plaintiff has to discharge the burden of proof yeah. in order to be successful before the defendant has any arguments or submissions or, or whatever. If the plaintiff cannot discharge the burden of proof, we are not even talking about Cook and Lewis. We are not even talking about the National Court. Right. The plaintiff failed. It is only when the plaintiff cannot discharge the burden of proof for very specific reasons mm -hmm. mentioned in Cook and McGee, where science cannot help him out. Not his expert witness, not his mother, 
<laughs> whatever he wants to bring yeah. to the trial. Yeah. It's only then, and only then, that his failure to discharge the burden of proof is not fatal for the claim. Yeah. Otherwise, causation is wrong. Yeah, and that's when we get these diff this different uh, nomenclature of material increase in the risk of being coming in. So it's a, an exception to but for, for that reason. We're not using but for in this case. The court is amending the causation analysis. Well, but for is still used because but for are necessary to establish that the dust can cause dermatitis and that uh, riding a bike can cause dermatitis. That's where but for must exist. Right, but then the court says, well, that's inconclusive, so we're going to go to this next step of in McGee. Did the defendant materially increase the risk of McGee developing dermatitis? And they find that's where the threshold has been met. Uh, I'm just out of curiosity, do you look at a substance case work where like the same similar circumstances where a worker works for I think four different companies? We'll get to that. But I think you're thinking of the English case. The English case. Yeah. So the English cases diverge. I have a question that uh, just mentioned this could be a new test of conversion. So whether this test could coexist with the but for test is that even in this case because the factory because the factory is not providing a washing facility, decrease in material increase the risk. Yeah. But uh, maybe the defendant can produce evidence say that even I provide the facility, you still have you, you will still develop the symptom, the dermatitis. Because you write uh, back right, right back home, but if the defendant can show this, but still the 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 plaintiff can say that you materially increase the risk, what will be the outcome? Yeah. So I think what you're saying is you're amending the facts that if the National Coal Board had provided some sort of washing facilities, yeah, they could then say, well, you got the dermatitis from your bike ride home. Yeah, because it's a over a period of time, I guess. Maybe in the beginning there is no washing facility. Then, but uh, the later stage, the uh, washing facility, and uh, maybe the factory can be hire some expert to, uh, expert to say that even with the washing facility, you are still going to develop the symptom. But uh, I mean, the plaintiff can still prove that the lack of the uh, material increase the risk. So both sides can can prove something positively. What will yeah. be the outcome? But I, I think. So your initial question was, can these two coexist? Yeah. And I would say they can. But for is the test. But if for scientific reasons and not through any fault of the plaintiff, that does not produce the kind of analysis we see in Barnett, for example, then the courts modify the analysis. So it's not that but for and material increase in the risk of injury coexist where a plaintiff could use either. It is in order to use the material increase in risk of injury analysis, you have to meet certain criteria that I think Dayan had talked a bit about and I had before that. There's another handle. So, <coughs> Snell. Versus Farrell. I'll give you a minute to reread. I think I gave you. No, I didn't give you a summary on this, did I? Okay, that was nice of me. Um, so you read the summary and take a minute to reread it, and then we'll look into it. <coughs> 
factually what happened here before we get into the analysis. happened naturally, the blindness in that eye, or it could have been the negligence of Dr. Farrell. So we see the format beginning already. We sort of have that first characteristic. Two sources, two reasons for the harm, so to speak, not two sources. But in this case, Snell has to show that it was the fault of Farrell if she became blind. And that's made more difficult because scientifically she cannot draw that connecting line. So what does the court say? That it is not to um, establish a correlation, and then uh, by uh, adverse inference, if the defendant does not uh, provide any argument, you can accept that um, he was a source. Yeah. So, Mr. Justice Sapinka, and it's worthwhile, I would recommend that you get to know the when you're in practice, get to know the judges uh, that write the decisions. So here, the reason why I mentioned Sapinka is, you've taken evidence, you've read his book likely. He's the Sapinka and Sapinka Lederman and uh, Faust, I think that's now. Uh, or first. So he was an expert in evidence. And what his ruling says here is, for causation, you can have something that he calls inference causation. Which is what Constantino explained, but I'll repeat for clarity. That is, once Miss Snell establishes a connection between her harm and Dr. Farrell. In Sapinka's opinion, that may be enough for a trier of fact, a judge, to say, well, I think you've met your burden of proof. Uh, uh, you mean this step. And then, turns to Dr. Farrell and says, what do you say about this? She's saying, you did this. She's made a connection that you may have been the cause. She cannot perfect that connection because of the state of science. So before I infer that you caused her harm, what do you have to say? That's what inference causation is. And this is something that I gave you the quotation from another decision in the UK that uh, Sapinka cites with approval. This is part of a robust and pragmatic approach to the facts. So 
Remember I talked about an adverse inference. Here we see very particularly adverse inference being utilized as a tool in the test of negligence, specifically causation, and the exception to what for causation. But Sepetra took pains to say, I am not reversing the burden of proof or shifting the burden of proof onto Dr. Farrell. I am not saying that, Dr. Farrell, you must now prove you're innocent. And I think conceptually, it can be hard to understand the distinction that Sapinka is trying to make there. Ultimately, I think what he's trying to say is it is open to judges at the trial level to be persuaded by the evidence put forward by the plaintiff on causation, where but for exception comes into play. But what we're going to then do is say to the defendant, what do you have to say about this? So what's interesting, and we'll see this in Clemens when we get to it, the case, the Supreme Court is of the opinion that it's never used an exception to but for analysis. It's just talked a lot about it. This being one of the cases. Now the reason why they say it has not been an exception, and further to the point I was talking about was Pinka saying the burden of proof was not shifted to Dr. Farrell, is they're relying upon the inference being made, the adverse inference made, where the defendant cannot or does not produce evidence to dissuade from that inference. So in the facts of Snell, Snell says he did it, Dr. Farrell. Here are all the things that went wrong. It may have been that I could have developed this naturally, but the preponderance of evidence suggests he did. And the court says, okay, what do you have to say about this, Dr. Farrell? Keeping in mind, Dr. Farrell, if you do not have anything to show that you didn't do it or to show that maybe it couldn't have been you, we will infer adversely against you. I have a question about the difference between uh, adverse inference and uh, shifting of the uh, evidentiary burden. Yeah. And why the court uh, insists that this is not a uh, shifting of burden, it's just a uh, difference? Because they are saying Dr. Farrell does not have to disprove his <coughs> liability. But based on the facts, the court is free to infer adversely that he was responsible. So they're not asking Farrell to prove positively that he didn't do it. And I think we can see that in this case. If Farrell had said, look, I did all these things, I did what was proper, here's evidence to show that in these types of surgeries at this time, there is a 40%, I'm making this number up, 40% chance that people just go blind and we don't know why, maybe that would have been sufficient. So he doesn't have to say, look, I didn't do it, it's her bad eye that did it. So it's not putting an onus on him. He can say something like, I did all this, and it could have been this, the 40% chance. So that's why they're saying it's not shifting the burden of proof. Uh, 
That's what I just said. So, so then he can explain, like before we just... Pick right, but he doesn't have to prove his innocence. Or, or that's not the right term. Prove that he wasn't liable. He can say, yes, Miss Snell is correct that I could have been a factor, but here's evidence to show that in 40% of these types of surgeries, people do go blind a bit of time afterwards. And in that case, he's not saying, he, he, the court isn't asking him, prove it wasn't you. He's saying, look, here's evidence to the contrary. Uh, Dayon, I'm just swinging around. Yeah, I was just, uh, you know, this now is Farrell, obviously. Dr. Farrell either had a bad lawyer or someone drafting a bad waiver for him on consent. Like, you know, any doctor asking you to attend a surgery, like a cataract is pretty much a very routine yeah. thing. It's an easy thing. It's a day thing, couple of hours. You're yeah, my, my mother just had it done, and they yeah. do people in batches of five, which I found weird. Yeah. But, you <laughs> know, it's like they keep rolling them in every 15 minutes. But I bet every surgeon is having a labor or consent where you acknowledge the ability yeah. that you may go blind because of that routine surgeon because surgery because there is a percentage of people actually going that way. So yeah. and, and the consent was the proper in place, uh, we wouldn't be talking about stone very much. But the, I would it's say... A, it's an old case, like maybe 30 years ago, the, the idea of... It's not that long ago. <laughs> I think we were all born by then. Yeah. Or trained by then. <laughs> like, yeah, at that time they didn't sign a thumbs of paper before. <laughs> like, Every there, were, there were waivers then. I think, just on Dayon's point, a waiver only goes so far, though. If Farrell hurried the surgery, for example, or seemed... Uh, careless in some way. The waiver doesn't waive that. So I'm not sure. I'm just a bit hesitant to, to sort of blankly say if he had a better waiver, he would have been okay. I don't know if that's the case here. And given this course, I think it's important to point out because exclusion laws of waivers and so on. We know they can be set aside. Oh, it's, it's a contract, like basically intercepting the uh, portion activity and maybe you know, for one thing. Yeah. I, I know you're talking about causation. I was just getting it as a comment. Yeah, um, you know, yeah. I, I, I'm not quibbling with you. Just when statements are made, as you might have noticed in the class, I try to, if, if there's something that could be misconstrued, I'll try to get it back. Um, who was next? Uh, there's somebody here. Okay. Yeah. And then, yeah. I just find it a little bit strange almost trying to avoid reverse onus of proof here. Um, well, what is rever what is reversing the burden of proof? Well, meaning that the proof now to, to say that I didn't do it. It's not my cause that's responsible for that. In other words, it's shifted to the defendant. But we're saying here, and, and you're, tr you're trying to make the point that it is not in a direct way, but in some way he ought to show that the other possible cause somehow was more responsible, more than 51%, than him being the causation, his action being the causation. So I'm just seeing it's almost like a semantic situation. Well, let me put this to you. What's the difference between reversing the burden of proof and an adverse inference? Well, this is what I'm trying to grapple with, because we, the, the proof is I didn't do it, reversing the burden yeah. of proof, and the inverse, In, the adverse, adverse um, inference is saying they more likely being other possible cause, the way yeah. I'm looking at this. In other words, it could have, 
the atrophy could have come from natural causes, yeah. or it could have come from what I have done, but I'm going to argue that it is more likely, more than 51% likely to come from natural causes. So but There's a big gap there between having to prove, in Farrell's case, that he didn't do it, which would be reversing the burden of proof, and persuading the court not to make an adverse inference. Because that's who you're trying to convince. You're trying to convince a judge that you that you were not liable in this case. And that's why I'm saying he, Farrell could adduce evidence on different things, statistics and so on, these operations. But if the court isn't satisfied with that, which it has the right to do, the power to do, sorry, then they can still make an adverse inference. But it's very different from a ver reversal of the burden of proof where Farrell must prove his non-liability. <coughs> that's the gap we're sitting in. And that's why I said I think it can be a bit hard to grapple with. But one is mandatory, the reversal of the burden of proof. Show me you didn't. Adverse inferences convince me that there was something else going on. And those are two very different standards to meet. But practically, the argument would be the same. How so? Because in both ways, when I try to prove that I didn't do it, I would provide evidence for the other cause that it's more likely that the natural cause happened. Mm -hmm. so it, it, I would argue the same thing. It's it's in both cases it, the difficulty shifts to the let's say the, the onus of proof hasn't shifted, but the difficulty of proving because we have to kind of prove now you have to prove about the fifty one percent. Yeah, that's not quite what they're saying. Pra yes, I know, but practically I'm trying to imagine the two different arguments. <coughs> The but th this is, as I said, the, co the Supreme Court takes the view, you may disagree, but this is their view, this was not a case of it, an exception to but-for causation. We applied but-for, but-for, the but-for test has something called inference causation. And this is in... How can we limit the extent of this? Uh, what does this principle apply? Like in, in this situation? Every, uh, that in every case where the plaintiff has uh, difficulty in establishing the... Uh, where? It, uh, usually it's where there is a science issue. Mm -hmm. yeah, we'll see where the Supreme Court says no to that even, but at some point they just are wrong. Because it, it may provide some uncertainty about uh, yeah. why do we have inference Yeah, but so. Because in the beginning, with the two people hitting in the same, I can yeah. have some certainty. So in this situation, I can clearly see the injustice. Yeah. But when we accept situations where the plaintiff does not have to prove this causation of 51%. But look at. Keep it to the facts. When we have these cases that do something different, what I advise you is always remember the facts in which that reasoning was held. Because those are very important. So here, Snell says he did it. And this is why I think he did it. And Sapinka at the Supreme Court says, it is open, as it was in Snell, for the trial judge to say, I think Miss Snell has met her burden of proof to a balance of probabilities. I infer causation absent anything Dr. Farrell says to the contrary. So if we think about, if it helps, we think about that 51%, Miss. Uh, Snell has got to 45%. And the judge infers her across the line. So when there is a high likelihood? Yeah. 
So it's not like uh, this could have happened. <coughs> there, like in this case, it was either it happened naturally or he did something. And it's unfortunate we don't really have good facts on how this could have happened naturally. But that aside, what we have here is not an instance of infinite possibilities. So I'll give you um, an example. In the passage I provided to you, they cite a case named Wilshire. Wilshire is a case from 1980s Britain, House of Lords, where I think it was children had died. A few children had died at the same time. And there were five possible reasons for why they died. One of which was the hospital's negligence. So the question would be, could we infer in that case causation when negligence is one of five possible reasons? And the answer I would say is no. Because that all you've done is identify the possible reasons for why the harm arose. You haven't got close enough for this to be an issue of science cannot get you across the line. You've done everything you can, and science is holding you back. So it's very discreet when it arises. So, and the test took the sours and substantial risk of Sorry, to which? With the previous case in uh, McGee. Could this also be useful instead of... It could be. So this is part of the problem. The Supreme Court of Canada says we've never had to use the exception to but for causation. But lawyers in Canada keep arguing my client can't meet the causation analysis because the defendant materially increased the risk of injury, they, but they can't meet that but for analysis. So... Here we get into, I'll put it this way. You're representing a client, and the plaintiff, you're the defense. The plaintiff says, well, on a but-for analysis, we're limited, so we're looking at material increase through McGee. What do you do? You have to understand how McGee works. Well, because it's a viable argument. So a question for you, just where, yeah. where you stop. So, to come to McGee, we actually have to have a checkmate situation. The plaintiff cannot prove it. The defendant cannot disprove it. Or so it's only it. yes, this guy. So it's only when you have that equilibrium yeah. of no proof on both sides, no matter how you call yeah. argument on the defense side. It's only when you have that scale absolutely even then you can have McGee working on Yeah. It's only that then. And we'll see after the break, we'll, when we get to Clemens, I think Clemens shows it well, but Hanke is another case that will show it. So the next two cases, we'll be able to look into deeper into when this is used. And the Supreme Court says in both cases, these are not exceptions to but for. So how about we take a break there, uh, 730, 7.50, come back, and the attendance is over here if we can. Sorry. No, they're saying but for causation was used, but specifically inference causation. You're representing the client, you represent them however you can, within the bounds of the law. But Hanky is a case that I 
do not understand how it got to the Supreme Court. Because Hanke is uh, has an esteemed position in Canada, he lives at Modi Garden, which means he resurfaces the ice in the hockey rinks. And what happened was there were two novels, two holes in the Zamboni, one for water and one for gas. And he put, whichever way it was, he put the water in the gas or the gas in the water. Water in the gas And why I don't know, understand why this got to the Supreme Court is, if you don't know which hole is which, you have bigger problems in life. Yeah. You know, for a guy that is supposed to be employed to drive this vehicle, putting water in the gas tank, I do not understand. And then he has the audacity to sue the manufacturer of the Zamboni. He sues them because he says they did not label the water and gas tanks clearly. <coughs> and clearly this, he has a problem at the causation stage. Because it's hard to say what for the lack of clarity in signage, I would not have put the water in the gas tank. Because this wasn't the first time he used it. He, saw, like, he wasn't paying attention. So his lawyer, to his lawyer's credit, tries to get around this by saying that to the court, we should use the material contribution test. That while my client maybe should have known which tank was which, resurfaced materially contributed to the rip to his injury by not properly signing the gas and water tanks. Now, what's the problem with material contribution based on these facts? Let's look through that. And let's think back to McGee, because that was the case where we saw it was a material increase in the risk of injury. Here, they're talking about material contribution. Um, the court messes up on the language. So let's just say we're applying McGee here. Factually, do we have the same set of, same sequence or arrangement of facts in Hanky as we did in, in McGee. In McGee, there was another possible cause of injury. Right. And here, there is. Unless you count Hanky being an idiot. Yes. No. Yes, and that's a cause. <laughs> so, like, idiocy, unfortunately, is not a claim. It's related to the oil guy. Sorry? It was related to the oil guy. The oil guy. Oh, what? The last decision. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the the big So here, the lawyer is his lawyer is trying to get around the idea that his clients, you know, in English they have all we have all these sayings like two beers short of a six pack, two cylinders short of a whatever. Have you heard these? Yeah. Two fries short of a happy meal. Sorry? Two, Two fries, fries short. yeah. Not the brightest bulb in the drawer, things Sorry. like that. <laughs> so, Hanky was not the brightest guy in the room. So you were trying to get around that. So I understand why the judge, I'm sorry, the, the lawyer for Hanky put this forward. And you don't have to expect the driver of the machine to be a genius. 
No. I mean, I think it's but normal I, that you put the... But I do expect the lower court and the appellate court to get to have some understanding of causation. So I do not understand why this case had to go to the Supreme Court to clarify it. Because as we said, in McGee, we have these two sources of harm, but one common agent of harm. We do not have that here. We don't have any confusion about what caused the harm. So, in order for there to be a material contribution, you have to have more than one actor contributing. And Hanky's lawyer tries to say, well, that we do have that because we have two tanks. <laughs> well, it, that's not what's happening. That's not what McGee was about. That's not what we're doing when we're saying that the but-for test has limitations and this arises in certain circumstances. Hanky is not one of those circumstances. So the Supreme Court takes the opportunity. I think they took the case to clarify yes. matters. I don't know if they were successful. But they say material contribution comes up only when there are two requirements met. First, the plaintiff must establish that it is impossible to prove causation based on the but-for test and that this impossibility results from factors beyond the plaintiff's control. Second, the plaintiff must establish that the defendant breached the standard of care and that his or her injuries fell within the scope of the risk created by the defendant's breach. And neither of these arose here. I've added in that the court, I gave you a, a, a passage from the case where the court says these are exceptional circumstances. In those exceptional cases where these two requirements are satisfied, liability may be imposed even though the but-for test is not satisfied because it would offend basic notions of fairness and justice to deny liability by applying a but-for approach. So here we have crystallized what we've been talking about, that is why common law courts will amend the causation analysis in certain exceptional circumstances, and it's articulated here. Unfortunately, the lesson wasn't learned, because we have the Clements case. And I, again, do not understand why Clements got to the Supreme Court. I do not understand why this was misunderstood as a material contribution to risk case. So here, we have a husband and wife. They are driving on their motorcycle. The motorcycle is 100 pounds overweight. Not because of either of them, they've lo loaded stuff on. <laughs> a nail punctures one of the tires. He's lying. <laughs> and it remained in the tire. So, because, why? Because he was speeding. He was driving 120 kilometers an hour. And then, he he changed the speed and the nail fell out. And this is where things get very bad. Because they, the bike crashes and his wife suffers severe brain trauma. Now you may wonder, well, why is the wife suing the husband? Yeah, that was the question. I, I think that it's insurance. Sure. Sure. Right. It's all about insurance. Uh, it's not that this is coming from a divorce. Uh, the, you will see this commonly that, uh, for example, children, 
if children were in a car where their parent was driving and the car got into an accident, the grandparents will sue on the parent on behalf of the grandchildren for the insurance money. Good idea. Sorry? Good idea. So that's what's happening here. So how is how does the plaintiff's lawyer make the case? that this is material increase in the risk of injury. Okay. Nail speed and, and the weight. Over the <coughs> so here we have three reasons potentially why they crash. But is this an instance of material increase or material contribution. Here's the key difference. Remember before I talked about a British case called Wilshire. If you identify five reasons why something has happened, and one of them is the negligence in that case of the hospital, you cannot argue material contribution. You have to prove that they did it. Here, Clement, the plaintiff's lawyer, is saying, well, there are three reasons why the bike got into an accident. Three factors factored in. Speed, nail, and weight. But those are three independent factors. They're not connected, like in McGee. <coughs> McGee worked at a brick factory, lots of dust. Rode his bike home, apparently lots of dust. Two sources of a harmful agent being dust. He had dermatitis, which was caused by the dust. Here we have three independent factors that each in themselves could have caused the accident. I think the facts established it was basically because of the nail in the tire. So, this is not a case of material contribution. I think, it, did I give you a summary of this case? Yes. Okay. So, uh, quoting from the the textbook. Uh, as a general rule, a plaintiff cannot succeed unless she shows, as a matter of fact, that she would not have suffered the loss but for the negligent acts. A trial judge is to take a robust and pragmatic approach to determining if a plaintiff has established that the defendant's negligence caused her loss. Remember that phrase, a robust and pragmatic approach, that we saw Sopinka use in Snell versus Farrell. So you see it being applied. Then they say scientific proof of causation is not required. Second, exceptionally, a plaintiff may succeed by showing that the defendant's conduct materially contributed to the risk of the plaintiff's injury, where the plaintiff has established that her loss would not have occurred but for the negligence of two or more tort feasors, each possibly, in fact, responsible for the loss, and B, the plaintiff, through no fault of her own, is unable to show that any one of those tort feasors was, in fact, the cause. So these are the criteria for material increase, material contribution, and risk to be applied. You have to have these factors. Now, I would suggest to you that the Supreme Court is wrong on point two. 2A. You do not need to have two or more torque feasors. A torque feasor is like in Cook and Lewis. Both hunters were torque feasors. Wrongdoers. 
but we know that we do not need two or more tort feasors. Why? Because in McGee, we had material increase in the risk of injury, and we only had one tort feasor, the National Coal Board. So I don't know why they say you need two or more. Yeah, constantly. When I read the decision, I had the impression that they somehow they don't want the material contribution test to apply to other cases than to other cases because in 36 paragraphs to 38, they talk about um, how this could solve with the infants. Thirty-eight paragraph. We talk about scientific impossibility, and how uh, that we always have scientific impossibility, and that we don't request the absolute certainty, and this can be solved with the uh, inference causation. Yes. Yeah, so somehow, you know, like it, I got the impression that they don't want the machine. No. So what Constantina is referring to is in the case they say basically, remember that Snell decision? Well, Snell had it right, except you don't need scientific evidence to establish causation. You can have inference causation. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. And they say, so to say that uh, the absence of scientific evidence is the reason for putting aside the but-for test is wrong. This is an example of one of a few things that I think the Supreme Court shows that even they don't fully understand what's going on. I don't mean that in a, an arrogant way. I think if you look at the English cases, they have a better grasp on causation and the exceptions to causation. The Supreme Court of Canada, and I think Constantine is right, I think the Supreme Court of Canada is very concerned about people using an exception to but for. To the point that they say we've never used it before. Which I don't think is accurate. Because we looked at Cook and Lewis. It's not material contribution or material increase, but it's not but for. It's not a strict but for application. They may say, well, that was inference causation. That was the first time we used inference causation. But I think that then draws attention to the scientific point that they try to shut down. They say you don't need scientific evidence, and Snell shows that. Well, I don't think that's quite accurate because Mrs. Snell would never have gotten to the point of inference causation had it not been for the limitations of science at that time. So to say you don't need scientific evidence, it's kind of, it reminds me a bit of Sadati that we looked at. You don't need medical evidence to show that somebody has suffered psychiatric damage. I understand that, but I don't think the same point arises here in exceptions to causation to but for causation. Because if it weren't for the limited state of science, Miss Snell or McGee would not have gotten to the point where but for arguably was modified. Because on a strict but for analysis, Miss Snell Cook would not have passed or met their burden of proof. They couldn't have. So 
I think that the point about scientific evidence is overstated because of this fear the court has of people trying to use material contribution or material increase arguments to get dance around meeting the, the burden of proof at the causation stage of the negligence claim. But in doing so, I think they confuse not only themselves, but the rest of the country. And more or less perpetuate what we see, in my opinion, in Hankey and Clemens. And that is savvy plaintiff counsel exploiting the lack of understanding in the <coughs> exceptions to but for analysis. Yeah. Uh, I'm just, uh, are we at the stage where you're saying there is alternative for but for, or is it modification of but for? Modification. Because here we are speaking in Clemens, material contribution, the list test removes the requirement of the but for causation and substitutes proof of material contribution to risk. I'm, I'm just, I want to be clear that it's, we're still, the, the rule in Canada is still the but for yep. with modification. It's not a substitute. No, and all that the court is saying is what you would call obiter. The court says, we haven't dealt with this, but if the case comes up, this is what should be understood. So if material contribution comes up, this is what's happening. Excuse me, what's the, uh, what do you mean obit? Sorry? What do you mean obit? Oh, oh. uh, you've never heard that term before? Obiter? Obiter dicta? That's the opposite of ratio. This is that. If that helps. So, and, like, we can go into further detail about it. I'll just note one thing. Like, material contribution to risk will be different from a material increase in the risk of harm. Material contribution to risk, you contributed to the harm. Material increase is you increase the risk of the harm. But it doesn't necessarily mean you had a hand in what came about. Contribution and increase, material contribution, material increase, really, if you look at the English cases, is more clearly delineated. And that refers to what's called divisible and indivisible. So a divisible loss is where you can show that if somebody hits you with their car, they, call, they break your leg. But the next person that hits you at the same time with their car breaks your arm. You can divide the losses. Indivisible means the kind of harm that arises cannot be divided. And oftentimes, um, the asbestos cases, do you know what asbestos is? All the So in factories, actually Osgood, they, they closed down the building before they, this is rebuilt. It had asbestos in it before. So they had to get it all out. And asbestos fibers were linked to lung cancer, mesothelioma. And that was believed to be indivisible. That once you've inhaled an asbestos fiber, that, and it uh, created mesothelioma, you could inhale more fibers and it wouldn't uh, make it worse. It, it, you're done, so to speak. <coughs> so that, that's where the language of material contribution, material increase comes from. But the court doesn't seem to be too alert to that. I'm not sure why. It's so as an author of the Supreme Court, is it the law? No, it wouldn't be law, but if you were litigating a case where you thought material contribution to risk mm -hmm. was being used, you would look at and cite Clemens, because it's an authoritative source. 
of the legal understanding. Now, one final quizzical point that comes from Clement <coughs> is the Supreme Court of Canada says, gets into legal theory. And I flagged this for you when we started towards. In this case, they say, the way to look at all negligence claims is to look at them as matters of corrective justice. Do you remember what corrective justice is? Anyone? Correcting harm in society. Yeah, so it's sort of, if you're familiar with philosophy, it's derived from Immanuel Kant. And the idea is that um, the wrongdoer pays for his or her own wrongdoing. So you don't have insurance. You hit somebody with your car, you pay for it yourself. And they say, this is the legal theory. And then they cite one book by a law professor at University of Toronto named Ernest Wander. And that's very complicated because, first of all, most practitioners couldn't care less about legal theory. But when the Supreme Court says this is the approach to take, you then all of a sudden have to consider that, I guess, at least. And the problem with how they discussed corrective justice is corrective justice is not a homogenous concept. There are different understandings of what it means. And Ernest Wonder is not the only author. Clemens. So to me, Clemens is a very problematic case. It creates a lot of complications that do not help, especially in an area that is not well understood. So if you feel a bit confused, that's understandable. Because it seems as though the Supreme Court is as well. So very simply put, what we're looking at is the test for causation is but for. There are certain circumstances, the requirements of which have to be met, and these were noted in Hanke and Clemens, that allow for a modification of the but for analysis to loosely material contribution to risk or material increase to risk as the assessment of causation. That, that's why I was saying the Supreme Court uses them interchangeably, but I suggest to you that they're actually not interchangeable. But for our purposes, for here, they are interchangeable. I'm flagging that they're not because I think we can say, I can show you how they're not. And it can come up in the future. That's all. So, this, I find the exceptions to but for are kind of like promissory stuff. It can take a lot of time to understand what's going on, but the amount of time you spend trying to figure that out is disproportionate to the amount of time that it will actually come up. So, except, I guess, the one caveat would be, we have two cases where plaintiff's counsel are using this in a very strategic manner. I get the sense you're all cost agent out. I'm looking at. Let's go to remoteness. Just so that the um, 
cover this off. This is very green. So the final aspect is uh, establishing a negligence claim is remoteness. And we touched on this before. If you recall, we talked a bit about it in the first class with Rankin's Garage. Because it seemed as though the Supreme Court, in talking about duty of care, was importing the language of remoteness. And remoteness is basically saying that the sequence of events that transpire are not reasonably foreseeable. Briefly put, it's too remote. And I'll draw your attention to the Wagon Now number one case. So, and I'll just read out the facts. I think I gave you this case. The appellant's charters of the Wagon Now the ship carelessly permitted oil to spill into Sydney Harbour, Sydney, Australia. Uh, while taking on fuel. The oil, which continued to escape for over a day, was carried by the wind and tied under the respondent's wharf. The respondent's employees were using welding equipment. Some molten metal fell, igniting a rag that was floating on some debris. The burning debris either directly ignited the floating oil or ignited it after first setting the oil soaked pilings of the wharf ablaze. The respondent's wharf and some of its equipment were severely damaged in the ensuing fire. So think about that sequence of events. Oil is spilling from the wagon now. And it starts a sequence of events that takes you through um, to the final point that the wharf is burned and damaged badly. And the question is, is this too remote to have occurred? Because in tort, you're only liable for things which are foreseeable. And the wagon mound, the, owner, the charters of the ship were saying, this was not foreseeable. Just because oil was leaking from the ship doesn't mean that the whole wharf blows up. But they lost. The defendant was, uh, defendants was liable only for the reasonably foreseeable consequences of its negligence. The foreseeability test was paid on the grounds of fairness and justice. So the court is saying, you accept the consequences of your negligent conduct. You do not have to foresee the specific sequence of events. So simply put, oil spilling into a harbor will cause some sort of damage. Specifically, what kind of damage is you do not need to foresee. It's sufficient that it's foreseeable that it will cause damage. And I think this is clarified in the Hughes versus Lord Advocate case. The next one. The defendant's employees left a paraffin lamp uh, and on and an open manhole unattended, and an eight-year-old boy knocked the lamp into the manhole. The vaporized paraffin that escaped from the broken lamp caused an explosion. The boy fell into the manhole and was badly burned. And the court, the House of Lords says the plaintiff was negligent, that it was sufficient that the plaintiff had suffered a kind of harm that was foreseeable. It wasn't necessary to foresee the manner in which the accident occurred, the mechanics of the accident, or the pre precise sequence of events. Because if you say what has to be foreseeable is this sequence of events, that's a high threshold to me. So the court is saying it's only harm that is foreseeable. Now that seems simple, but the next case I would suggest shows how there's a scope within which 
the measurement of foreseeability of harm is assessed. So the defendant carelessly failed to control the rat population on his farm. The plaintiff worked on the farm, contracted Wiles disease after coming into contact with rat urine. <laughs> So my understanding from the case was uh, the urine seeped into an open wound of his, so he had a cut. But the Court of Appeals said there was no liability here because it was reasonably foreseeable that the defendant's breach might lead to injury through rat bites, but not rat urine. Now I find that to be quite a narrow interpretation of what it constitutes reasonable, reasonably foreseeable harm. My perspective is the rat is a bad thing. How it harms you is almost irrelevant. Whether it bites you or it pees on your open wound. <laughs> Here the court arguably is saying you have to kind of foresee something more precise. Yeah, which isn't really what the Wagon Mound or uh, Hughes is saying. But there is a scope within which remoteness is assessed, and these cases, I think, articulate that scope. Now, the concept of the thin skull plaintiff, that was mentioned before in, in another class, I forget when, Smith versus Lee's brain, basically is the case that says you take your victim as you get them. Smith is kind of a, quite an unfortunate case. He worked in a, uh, I think it was a steel factory, and some molten steel somehow leapt out of the, a canister or something and got onto his lip and caused him to die of cancer years later. So the defendant says, well, that's just too remote. The evidence was that Smith was predisposed to cancer. So the brain is saying, well, hold on, like, it's a freak accident. We can't be held liable for that. And the court says, you take your victim as you get them. So if you are the author of some sort of wrong, you bear the consequences, the foreseeable consequences of that wrong. In Smith, the foreseeable consequences were extreme. Death. But that was what was applied. Oh, question for yeah. you. So obviously, uh, the staff of us uh, mm -hmm. did things called printing as well. Yeah. <coughs> but he didn't really go past the uh, Right, I think I gave you an excerpt from it uh, in the notes. So just going down to Mustafa. Um, the remaining question is whether the breach also caused the plaintiff's damages in law or whether it was too remote to warrant recovery. The court writes, the only evidence was about his own reactions which were described by the medical experts as highly unusual and very individual. That's coming from the court of appeal question. So why did the But that's the same with cancer. Another person Yeah. But let's, let's put them side by side, Smith and uh, Mustafa. Mustafa, I think we can distinguish from Smith, because in Smith, this is just a freak accident. He was predisposed, but um, he, nevertheless, the molten lava or molten steel got on his lip. It could have happened to anyone in that position. Like him. Mustafa, the evidence is that he was really, I don't mean this negatively, but a strange character. He really was 
not a foreseeable. So he, so he got a Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> His reaction was not foreseeable. <laughs> I would say that in psychiatric damage, we apply the personal or but yeah. then we have physical damage, we have the things about Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, like, because because things can't uh, rule into Mustafa, you take the victim as well. Yeah. So then he, he would have won, but in psychiatric damage, maybe. I don't know. That, like. Because it's more uncertain, that's why I think. What is more uncertain? Because the sensitivities of a person and his reactions are more. Yeah. Whereas cancer is something more, I don't know, like more obvious. That's why we have this rule. If nobody can deny that this person died from cancer that was caused by the burn. Yeah. Whereas in Mustafa, the court tried to limit. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Uh, Oversensitive people from suing because yeah yeah uh, I was going to say I agree I agree with what Thompson's saying. She's basically saying somebody with less mental fortitude uh, isn't uh, for the same opportunity to sue in the negative uh, regime, whereas somebody who has yeah. um, which and the mental fortitude could be. Something that's completely natural, right? something out of the control could be mental illness, yeah. or somebody is predisposed to cancer, or any other illness is protected. But so here, if, it is, just to say. if Mustafa, if we change it a bit, if Mustafa was um, predisposed in some way, like to anxiety disorder, then Smith would still apply. Would never say somebody that of the stuff is mentality must have some sort of sort of yes, but, it's yeah, so but at the remoteness stage, aren't we saying that you take your victim as you get them? So Mustafa will be okay at remoteness, but he still fails at the Did you agree? That, that's troubling for me in yeah. Mustafa that he failed duty of care, the first step. Remoteness, remoteness, I understand, I get it. But why duty of care? By, like, you know, like you drive the car and there is a freak show on the road, you run over a freak show and then, sorry about that freak show, you're a freak show. Like, you know, that, that's something that doesn't click in, in my mind. Remoteness, 100% I'm there, I got it. But duty of care, first of all, it's, it's unfair to select people that that are within, you know, proximity and, and foreseeability on duty of care by, by, by what? <laughs> by, by which token you are doing that? Which, which token you, you can divide people? It's against human rights to say that you're a freak show. So there is no duty of care over you. It's a human Like an L3 thing, right? Everyone should hit you because you, you're just traveling with mm -hmm. yeah. But the point, because there, there, there was a fly in the water. I mean, that's, it was not such a big issue. And that's the point. I agree with you. That's why you yeah. failed. I, 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 I mean, here I there was a, there was a bad injury on the, on the, on the, on the face, on the lip, and that ended up to be cancerous. So I think... See, I, I think... That's why it failed. In the I think the Supreme Court in Mustafa would have seen remoteness and the duty, their remoteness and duty analyses as needing to be harmonious here. I'm a little confused because remoteness has to do with foreseeability, but also we see foreseeability and duty. Yeah. Yes, but remember the, the, added, the additional point in Mustafa was reasonably foreseeable in a person of normal fortitude and sensibility. In general. So, because we saw possibility in the first stage and duty, why do we have to have remoteness? Oh, why have these? Yeah, because remoteness is about possibility. Because, so in remoteness, we can have, it's sort of that final check. I, I liken it, and I hope this works for you, I liken it to the Anne's Cooper test. 
where we have reasonable foreseeability and proximity as a, a legal analysis, then we have proximity as a policy point, then we have that second policy question which is more general. Remoteness, I see, is sort of this last point at which the court says, well, all the other points have been satisfied, so let's do sort of a final check. Is this something that is outlandish? The policy question. No, here, remoteness here, what we're talking about now, not in the policy. That this is just, so if you look at the wagon map, the sequence of events was just too remote. You couldn't have foreseen this. That, and if they chose that way, then fine. But they said, no, it was decided the way it was. That it was not too remote that if you let oil seep into the city harbor, it would cause damage. Is uh, remoteness of, uh, is remoteness all about foreseeability in sequence? There is there no directness in it? No, directness was the old test okay. in uh, Polemus, which was overruled in Wagon Mount. And I hadn't discussed that because I, just for time's sake, and because I get the impression people are tired, I went okay. to uh, Wagon Mount. So I will flag the one point of uh, Novus Actus in remoteness. That is where there's an intervening act. So um, on sports shows, they have these top tens. They have top ten uh, medical miscues. There's one from a football pitch where this guy was injured, and the two ambulance attendants pick him up in a stretcher, and they're running along, and then they drop him. They pick him up, then they run along and drop him again. That's an intervening act. You could say, well, the initial injury was he broke his leg. But by being dropped by these two Bootneck and clowns, wish. he suffered back injuries, let's say. And you'd say, well, the intervening act broke the chain of causation, is the way we put it, that the first defendant is responsible for everything up until the ambulance attendants pick them up. Then everything that happened from then on, the ambulance attendants are responsible for because of that intervening act. And I think you see this in criminal. Yeah, in criminal, I'm just thinking each case is I don't know, I've heard criminal in my So uh, next week, you have uh, we'll look at uh, misrepresentation. So we'll take uh, some time to go through that. I expect it will take a bit of time. Please do read the, the cases I ask you to read, especially the Deloitte and Touche case um, and the Imperial Tobacco, which was a test for you at your interview. Um, and we'll carry on from there. And that basically takes us to the end of the course. What?